My name is Sean Salamita, and this is my wife. I'm Amy. And uh, we own the Drone Cellars here on Salmon Island in Friday Harbor. Here at Madron, we have a focus on low intervention natural wines. We start to source from live certified and organic vineyards if we can. We always knew we wanted to uh, move back here and start our business here. It's home to us and we love the islands. Yeah. We wanted to kind of build our business and our winery around the islands that and we live family. in. family. And our family lives here. Exactly. In our family. We opened our tasting room just recently, um, on the 4th of July this year, actually. We were planning to open in March. Obviously, that didn't happen. <laughs> um, and there was lots of remodels. We pretty much redid the entire space. We had to raise ceilings. We had to redo the whole back area with the bathroom. It took a lot of a lot fun of work. work lot but, of work. you know, what What bet other to, stuff to do with uh, COVID lockdown, <laughs> then redo a ceiling. It's kept us busy. <laughs> Definitely a family business. We're and our dog, Severus, is like the mascot. <laughs> yeah. He hangs out at the winery and in the tasting room most days. You can come in for socially distanced tastings or um, food appetizers. We have a cheese and charcuterie with a local cheese and salami selection. And we really wanted to focus on local products. So our, the cheese that we feature is Sunnyfield Farms um, from Lopez, their goat cheese, which pairs perfectly with all the wine. It's amazing. I don't know how, but like it just, it's, really it's amazing. <laughs> For the virtual sparkling tasting, we're going to be doing the two pet nuts. So it's a pet nut since so and a pet nut recently, both 2019. And then a 2018 uh, Method Traditionnel Cinso. So you get to taste the difference between the two years of this Cinso and also the two different types of winemaking. There's a lot that goes into sparkling wine and there's more than one kind. So some people might be familiar with uh, regular champagne, but maybe not how it's made actually or why it's different than Pet Nat and the whole spectrum there. So it's a fun wine to drink and it's also a fun wine to make. It's my favorite type of wine to make. So I wanted to share that with everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started here with our sparkling tasting. Are we good, Erin? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's, <laughs> let's go. Let's drink some wine. Yeah. So I don't know um, if you guys have any sparkling wine with you to taste. Hopefully you have ours. But if not, any uh, pet nat or sparkling wine will do. Um, we'll tell you about it. Um, but let's go ahead and dive right in. The first one we're going to be tasting is our pet nat Riesling. Sorry. I don't know if you can see it here. But A little blurry. Here, I'll get it up nice and close. So Pet Nat Riesling. Um, so also stands for Petulant Natural. Um, it's a much more up and coming style of sparkling wine, um, different than traditional sparkling. And uh, we'll go ahead and tell you about the difference and why it's such a fun uh, type of sparkling wine. Well, you so. can get right into that. I'll, I'll yeah, gonna Amy's gonna pour some for us here. <laughs> but uh, so Pet Nat, it's a uh, also called Method Ancestral, because it's the oldest way of making a sparkling wine. So here, I should like hold this up. Yeah, get a nice visual there. But uh, yeah, Pet Nat's really fun because it's uh, unfiltered sparkling wine and uh, you get a lot more rustic flavors. You get the flavors from the yeast. It's kind of fresher and fruitier and also tends to be more affordable. So it's a more accessible sparkling wine for most people than your traditional champagne. Um, but uh, we also make a still Riesling. I've worked with it for a few years in the past and thought it'd be really fun to do a sparkling version. So this is our sparkling 2019 Riesling. Don't know if you can see the bubbles there, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it's there quite, we go. quite bubbly. You wanna pour yourself some? And uh, yeah, like yeah. I said, if you guys have any sparkling wine that you are enjoying, yeah. feel free to uh, join in here and, and we also wanted to talk about a couple differences with uh, glassware. So like this is your traditional sparkling glass and it's, it's fun. You get to see like a nice, pretty sparkling bubbles, but you don't get quite as much out of the aroma. So if you want to really smell the notes in a sparkling wine, Can you a traditional a bit of a... wine glass is going to give you yeah. a better aroma. But uh, yeah, so our sparkling wine here, it's a, uh, Really Riesling, nice, nice, nice green apple. Lots of bright minerality. Um, <clears throat> Riesling's kind of known for its minerality. We do everything dry, so our Riesling is bone dry. Um, 
sparkling and still. Just really think it pairs well with food that way, not having it overwhelmingly sweet. Yeah, very very food friendly wine. Um, our our particular pet nuts are like Amy said, dry. We we tend to prefer dry wines, less sweet wines. We think they're more food friendly, and that's kind of like what we focus on here at Madrone is uh, <clears throat> minimal intervention. Um, expressive wines and pretty much all our wines are dry because that's our palate and we hope other people enjoy that as well. It's like but, uh, with Riesling, um, if you're trying to think of something to pair with Riesling, um, so Asian food is always a good bet with a Riesling and especially this because it's, um, you know, that minerality and that green apple can just really go well in the citrus. It can go really nicely with Asian food. Yeah. As well as um, particularly this sparkling Riesling. It goes really nice with seafood and light pastas. Be really refreshing with that. Yeah. And uh, describe more about how you made this one. This sure. particular Riesling. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and also just want to mention this is our first virtual tasting. So uh, bear with us. It's a, it's a new format for us, but hopefully everybody's uh, enjoying themselves. Uh, but yeah, how I made this one and what makes it different from traditional sparkling is that uh, when the wine's fermenting in, in the tank, you Steve. go ahead and uh, bottle it while it's still fermenting. And that gives you a lower carbonation level than traditional sparkling. So it's, it's uh, um, yeah, it's gonna be less bubbly than a traditional champagne. And it's also gonna be unfiltered because when you bottle it, when there's still live yeast in the bottle, then you get sediment. And that's part of pet nat. You're always going to have that sediment, and kind it kind of kinda, yeah, kind of adds to the flavor, and it'll it'll change over time, like any wine. Mm -hmm. But uh, <clears throat> sometimes you'll have more or less sediment, depending if the bottle is shaken up or if you let it sit. And it's kind of fun to taste the end of the bottle too, because then you get it get that really yeasty flavor. And some people like that, some people don't. I I like the flavor of the yeast. It adds a whole mm -hmm. other um, component. Com component complexity to the wine, but. Uh, Another thing that's fun about Pet Nat is that uh, each one's different. <laughs> Get a lot of variety with Pet Nat. Yeah, Sean, I, I want to jump in here. We've got a question coming in from the chat asking, yes. so the, the first sip is going to be different than the last sip of a Pet Nat. Is that true for all Pet Nats? Not true for all Pet Nats, but for our Pet Nat it is because our Pet Nat tends to clarify on its own in the bottle. So you'll get a nice sediment layer at the bottom. And if you don't like mix it up, which most people put it in the fridge and it doesn't get mixed up, then that is true. If the first sip's different. It's gonna you're going to get more of those like the very clear, clear um, champagne, fruitier, expressive thing. notes. Yeah. Um, and uh, when you get down to the bottom, there's going to be more yeast in it, so it's going to be more creamy and nutty almost, and you're going to get that flavor of the yeast as well. So that it will be different. So it's, it's another fun aspect of pet nat. Most, most pet nats are like that. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting to me. And I want to take this moment to encourage others to use the chat function. If you have any questions, we will have a Q&A at the end if you'd like to unmute yourself. Uh, but right now, feel free to use that chat to ask any questions. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead, please Sean. go ahead and uh, jump on there. Feel yeah. free to ask a question at any point. I'm going to go ahead and open mm -hmm. the next pet nat that we have. It's our pet nats and so. So you can start talking about that while I open it. Just yeah, so Cinso is a pretty fun varietal. Um, a lot of people might not be familiar with Cinso. Um, it's not a very <laughs> well-known varietal, at least not here in the U.S. It's a, it's a French varietal yeah. that's native to the Rhone Valley and also is prevalent in Provence. But um, it's been brought over to the U.S. and there's a little bit planted in Washington. And... Uh, <clears throat> So what Amy's pouring for you here is our 2019 Pet Nat Cinso. And so Cinso is actually a red grape. And so this is a, what's known as a Blanc de Noir. So it means a white wine from a red grape. So we got this from uh, Natchez Heights AVA. It's a strand vineyard. It's a very high elevation vineyard. So the grape doesn't fully ripen, but it ripens to good sparkling levels, which happen to be underripe grapes basically you don't want <laughs> as fully ripe <laughs> grapes for uh, for sparkling but with those underripe grapes sometimes you'll get uh, you can get a blanc de noir because if you press it gently you get no 
of no red color. You just get the, the pure juice, which happens to be white. Only the skin is red. And we did no skin contact. So that goes, you know, another part of pressing it right away is that it's just zero skin contact. So you don't get any of that color. Yeah. And last year was a, a, a colder year. So it was already just less ripe than usual. Yeah, kind of um, lent itself to that style. So sometimes like on a bottle of champagne, you'll, you'll literally see the words Blanc de Noir. And usually that means it's made with Pinot Noir or Pinot Meunier, those are red grapes. And it means it's white, it's a, a white wine from a red grape. So that's what we've done here, but with a Cinso and the Pet Nat version. <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not sure if this is related at all to um, what you're just talking about with the, the ripeness of the grapes, but we've got a, a question from the chat asking, at what sugar level do you bottle? And do you know how much pressure is developed from that? Yes, um, we do know, and it, it varies based on each wine. It's hard to uh, measure as it's fermenting, but, but roughly it's more of like a range of what you shoot for. So like a target that I shoot for is around two and a half um, atmospheres of pressure. And just to give you an idea of what that means, it's kind of an obscure measurement. So typical champagne is like five to six volumes um, or atmospheres of pressure. So that is literally like five times atmospheric pressure is a typical champagne, um, five to six. And so pet nats tend to be less bubbly, um, you know, more gentle on the palate. So I shoot for about two and a half atm atmospheres of pressure. And you just have to measure the sugar and do your calculations to ensure that that does happen because it's a moving target and you want to try to get it within the range. And then they asked about the sugar as well. Yeah, so the sugar is going to be being consumed as it's being fermented and you need to uh, calculate how much sugar is left um, when it's bottled. And then that will tell you, therefore, how much carbonation you're going to have because the sugar is going to be consumed in the bottle by the yeast and the yeast produce carbonation. And that is how you get sparkling in the wine because it's carbonated under pressure through that fermentation. And, and then you get the, the bubbles dissolved in the, in the wine. So I hope I answered <laughs> that question. Um, but... Uh, We've got another another question, I think, in the same vein, asking, are the underripe grapes more tart? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, so that's kind of like a, a style thing with champagne. You want to... And specifically, yes, we kind of like that in ours. Yeah, we, we like um, bright wines. I like to refer to them as bright. You know, they're, they tend to be more food-friendly wines. <clears throat> so high acid. When I say bright, I mean like higher acid, you know, it's like refreshing, it's maybe a little sharp on the palate, but it kind of wakes everything up um, and makes it very food friendly, I think. And then also that sharpness can um, become a little bit more subtle as it ages. Um, so yeah. a lot of the times we like to age our sparklings as well. These ones are newer, our pet nuts, we don't age as long, but um, the last one on our list, the full method traditional now, that one is aged two years in bottle. Yeah. It's so, a, yeah. So it's a little bit, has that little bit more, the sharpness is not as much. Yeah, it softens <laughs> as it ages. That's the yeah. great um, explanation there. But uh, the acidity helps it age. And also as it ages, that acidity will mellow on the palate. Mm -hmm. So the longer you let a wine sit, overall, it'll help it mellow. And by letting it sit on the yeast, that actually the yeast give it a softer quality as they kind of, break down and give up their amino acids, they help soften the wine. Um, so that that's a big part of Method Champenois, and I think we're getting close to that, but maybe real quick, we'll talk about the, the tasting pet. notes of uh, the Pet Nat Cinso. Yeah, so this one is a fun one. It's, <laughs> Cinso is a much different grape than Riesling. So that Riesling is more classic, crisp, um, you know, that bright minerality, but then the Cinso, it has a little bit more um, like quince and palm fruits. Um, on the on the nose. Yeah, maybe a little bit more minerality. Too. Yeah, a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit lighter body too. So I think this is a good one to pair with pastas or a fish dish or, or any kind of poultry really. Yeah, um, this one though, the Riesling mm -hmm. you would want to do yeah with a light pasta, which is similar, but also the Cinso could hold up to a heartier dish like a pork tenderloin. Um, it's got, you know, it can, 
Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of got that bright acidity <laughs> that I think would cut through like a nice like herbed pork roast or something. I, I think would be really nice, but uh, it's part of the fun of food and wine pairing. You know, we're trying different flavors and see what works together. But uh, yeah, so that kind of wraps up the uh, the pet nat. So I think I also mentioned it's called Method Ancestral because it's the most ancient way of making sparkling wine. So you just the wine gets bottled while it's still fermenting, and uh, you do nothing Time else filtering. at that point. You just let it finish in the bottle, and then that is what you get when you open it. Um, there's and no additional steps. And it's, I think one of the biggest difference is in like when you are holding the bottles and comparing them, um, like if you were holding a traditional champagne and you're holding a pet nat, if you look at them, the pet nat will have yeast in the bottom. Um, some will have a lot, some will have little. It depends on the winemaking style. Um, and then the traditional champagne will be clear because of the disgorgement process, yeah. which Sean will yeah, we'll, describe. We'll get more. into that next. And one other quick note I just want to mention. So this is our, our pet nat. This is what it looks like. And uh, you might have noticed <laughs> I wanted to show you the, the cork here. We chose to do ours under cork and cage just because we think it looks nice. It's a fun presentation. It also has our logo right on the cork there. Not sure if you can see it, but uh, <laughs> traditional um, pet gnats are done with a crown cap. So that's another way to tell that it's a pet gnat is that it'll actually have a crown cap on it like a bottle of beer. Um, so most pet gnats have that as well. It's just our stylistic choice to do a um, cork. Yeah. I'm glad that you guys pointed that out because we have a question about the corks asking, are there any problems with the corks blowing out with the CO2 forming? Um, well, yes, that would be a problem if it weren't for this wire hood portion. So that is why Champagne has this oversized cork that you'll see that is mushroomed. And that mushrooming happens when you put on the wire hood. So the wire hood machine actually squishes it down. It's just literally like this lever that has a little arm that twists the wire hood. It's kind of a pain. It, it's, it's takes very, a lot of very pressure. very manual <laughs> intensive process. But um, the wire hood is put on and squishes it and then twists it under this little ridge. So it keeps it captured so it's secure. So it's literally resisting the force of the carbonation and keeping it so it cannot come off. The, the bottle, if it were over carbonated, would probably crack and explode before and then, the, the cork would come off. And this but is a, they're, they're designed to be thicker glass. Yeah, I was gonna um, say that, sorry. Yeah. I didn't know you were getting there. <laughs> no, you're, you're good. But these uh, sparkling bottles are designed to hold pressure. So they'll hold up to seven atmospheres of pressure, um, which is a lot. Um, it's, it's more than like a, a bus tire. So um, they hold a lot of pressure in there and uh, that's what keeps all the bubbles inside the bottle. They're a much heavier weight glass. Like if you hold an empty, case of champagne glass and then hold an empty case of regular glass it's going to be exponentially heavier it's like twice as heavy yeah, yeah. well okay. moving right along you want to yeah so now i'm going to open up our um since so the 2018 method traditionnel um as you can tell it this one is actually a rosé um it's a very light rosé yeah but... more of like a peachy salmony color because uh i don't know if all of you are familiar with Sinso, but Sinso is similar to Pinot Noir in that it's a very delicate. <laughs> more pressure, as you know, there's, there's a nice bit of a pressure. So yeah, this in one there. is much more pressurized, as you can see. You probably can't see the smoke, or yeah. So this is a Not full that. method Champenois. It's uh, been aged about a year and a half in the bottle. Um, so we age it on the on the yeast, and then we do the riddling and disgorging process. Some of you might be familiar. If you aren't, I'll, I'll walk everybody through it. Um, but that's how you get a clear wine and you end up with a nice sparkling. This is about five atmospheres of pressure. Um, you know, it's a nice, pretty, like peachy rose color. Yeah. In comparison, mm -hmm. so this is our Pet Nat Senso and this is the Rose Senso. Yeah. And so 2018 is one of my favorites because. Uh, you know, the, the full traditional methods are fun. They take a lot more work. A you lot get a lot more, more <laughs> evolved flavors out of them because of that. So um, traditional champagnes are known for having kind of a creamy quality, and that flavor comes from the yeast. So as you age the wine, um, the yeast actually dissolve. And we actually have a visual aid here. So this is a 
part of our champagne in process. I don't know if you can see the, the sediment in there, but uh, the bottles are literally stored on their side like this for about 18 months is um, how it starts. You can go longer, but it takes that long for the chemical reaction to take place where the yeast give up their flavors and give like a creamy quality to the wine. Give that to you. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so this, our 2018, I think has some really nice like peachy toasted apricot notes and almost like a brioche, you know, like that's, that's a flavor that comes from the yeast. So you kind of get that creamy toasty flavor um, that can be so nice in, in sparkling wine. And just like, um, I'm sure <laughs> everyone who, you know, if you've learned about sparkling wine before, you know about the riddling process. Um, so this, so it will be stored on its side like this until we're ready to, um, to scourge. So we have a riddling rack. Um, how would you it's just... like, well, it's an A-frame rack. <laughs> That's a bunch it's of in a, yeah, shape like this with holes in it. And the bottle would literally be placed into the rack about at this angle. And then the whole rack is filled with these bottles. And then you have to go through every day and turn the bottle an eighth of a turn to the right, or it's about a quarter of a turn to the right, and then a sharp eighth of a turn back. And I don't know if you can see what that did, but you can see how the yeast is all moving around in here. So that creates this spiral in the bottle. And over time, the yeast will fall over itself, and that process kind of cleans the bottle as the yeast come down. And it gets trapped here in the head. Yeah, that's the whole goal, is to get all the yeast right here. And I don't know if you can see in the video, but underneath that crown cap is a little plastic plug. It's called a a bedool and that it looks like an empty shotgun shell casing basically so it it's a place for all the yeast to settle in and capture it so then when we disgorge it which just means to take the cap off the sediment blows out and you're left with clean wine if, if you do it right so we, <laughs> we do it the traditional way which is uh without freezing the neck we just do it by hand and we tilt the bottle um it's called a la volée which means follow the bubble so there's always like a bubble at the back. So we tilt it and Here, tilt it. A, have a, we'll have a clearer bottle. It'll oh actually God. be a better <laughs> visual aid. But with the clear bottle, you can, you can see the bubble. So imagine the sedimented bottle with the sediment in the neck. And as you tilt it and you follow the bubble and you tilt it the second that the bubble touches, you pop the cap off. And if you do it right, all the sediment comes out and you have clean wine um, that's you then cork and wire hood and we do zero dosage on our sparkling wine so bone that's dry. the finished product it's bone dry Red and fruit. uh yeah <laughs> that that's how you uh finish the method champenois so and i guess the one other detail i didn't add about the difference between method champenois is you let the wine um finish and then you let it sit and then to get that level of sparkling you have to add more sugar so you, you add a measured amount of sugar and yeast and that's calculated to give you about six atmospheric volumes of pressure because you're going to lose a little bit when you disgorge you, you lose about one atmosphere of pressure so after it's disgorged you're left with a nicely sparkling wine um, more bubbly than a pet nat because of the added sugar gives you more pressure but uh, John, we've got a, a question kind of in this uh, about yeast asking, is there a special kind of yeast that you use? Is it the same one for each variety? Um, yes, uh, good, a good question. question. Um, definitely a special yeast. There's only a few yeast that can handle the intense pressure of in bottle fermentation, especially all the way up to sh champagne levels. So we use a specific um, champagne sparkling yeast designed for secondary fermentation so that it completes that um, process in the bottle. Um, but we use different yeast for the first fermentation because that can give different primary flavors and aromas. Um, and and uh, it's like one of the few things you can do as a winemaker to, you know, give a little bit of say in what you think the wine will be like. But really the goal is to A little to bit like, of your own artistic style, even though it's not you know, too much of it. Yeah, I mean, it, for us, the goal is to try to just reveal the grape and the story. Um, it's what the French call terroir, which is really just a fancy word for- Where it's grown. Yeah, the essence of the grape, being able to taste and smell it, like where it's grown and the climate and all other outside influences. 
that's like apparent when you smell it and taste it. So I think the, the goal of the winemaker and what we strive for is to reveal that and basically not mess up the grape. <laughs> <laughs> Sean and Amy, I think that's a, a great segue to one of the questions asking how you got into this business and wondering what your, your individual backgrounds are. Yeah, um, great question as well. So I guess uh, it starts with me. Um, I, I got into the wine business by, uh, you know, seeking education. I went to Oregon State and studied viticulture and enology there, which means the science well, of... It starts before then. His parents yeah. took him wine tasting. <laughs> that <laughs> initially got me interested <laughs> in, in wine. You know, I um, don't come from like a winemaking background or family or anything, but my parents definitely enjoyed wine. And there's this very small AVA in Colorado where I grew up called the West Elks AVA. It's near Grand Junction or Palisade, if anyone's familiar with Colorado. But uh, they have like, I don't know, maybe 20 wineries there now and very small burgeoning wine industry. Um, but yeah, my parents took me to uh, one of the wineries there. <clears throat> and it was the first time I've like walked through like vineyards and like seen the whole um, idea of what a winery is or what they do. And I, I mean, so obviously inspired by it because I thought that was really cool. And I was inspired mostly by the, the vineyard. So I, I sought out education in, in horticulture and viticulture, but uh, you can't really separate the two. So, I mean, the degree is viticulture and enology, you learn both. But it was uh, in college that I learned, you know, how connected they are and that I, I want to do both. And uh, that led me to uh, end up on San Juan Island. I had been here before. Um, ended up dropping off a resume at San Juan Island Vineyards, got hired there, worked there for a few years, um, ended up meeting my wife, Amy, here on the island, um, and we met here, got, got married here, um, <clears throat> ended up actually moving to the Lake Chelan area because I kind of wanted to further my experience. Um, it's good to have experience working with different grapes in different regions, I think, so that's, uh, that was my goal. Got to work at uh, two different wineries in Chelan, um, Hard Road to Ho, which is in Manson, and then Melisoni, which is in Chelan right on the lake. And was a head winemaker there at Melisoni for about two years. And then uh, Amy uh, decided that uh, she Oh, was, we, we decided, yeah. <laughs> but well, my family lives here on San Juan Island. So we kind of had that pull to move home to be closer. Yeah. I'm just going to say that uh, you decided you're crazy enough to join me and wanting oh, to start yeah. our own winery. Um, <laughs> that's when we decided that we wanted to do that. So uh, we started that in 2016, um, got fully licensed and started producing in 2017. And uh, been working towards uh, opening our tasting room and all this you see here behind us now. It's a very long-term business prospect <laughs> and it's taken a couple few years to get here, but... Uh, yeah. And then uh, for me, I don't have a background in winemaking or anything. Um, we met in 2014 at a coffee shop. That's my passion is coffee. Um, so we met at Churchill Coffee House. Probably nobody knows or remembers that. And if they do, <laughs> it was great. It was right above <laughs> um, the ferry landing. Yeah, it was right above the ferry landing. Um, and I had never, you know, I would grew up on box wine with my mom. <laughs> um, and I didn't really know much. Um, but uh, I'm stubborn, so I learned. <laughs> I'm still learning. Uh, and she's being modest. She worked with me at Mel. Well, yes, yes. So then, when and has been, uh, yeah. you know, I moved to Chelan with Sean, um, and I worked at um, Blue Spirits Distillery. Uh, so I kind of got into that. So um, got into the industry, but a different part. So the um, the spirits industry. Um, so then I got to experience working um, in tasting rooms in that format. And then I got hired at Melisoni as a tasting room associate as well. I did both. Um, and also helped with the crush there. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I helped on the vineyard and yeah. um, worked in the tasting room um, as my first kind of experience with that. Um, and then since, you know, I've kind of 100% uh, dedicated <laughs> All uh, in. assistant and uh, the 50% of our, our uh, business yeah. and our production here. Yeah. But I'm more, Sean's the winemaker and cider maker. Um, I'm more in charge of 
social media and um, events, coordinating those. Um, and also web design, like I designed our website and um, promotional materials. I kind of prefer to do that. Not prefer to do that, but I-, I um, She's better at it. I'm better at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, and then I'm the assistant. So I'm kind of the manual labor at the winery. Um, I'm the muscle. I'm the yeah. muscle, yeah. <laughs> um, so I just assist him with whatever he needs there. We don't have any um, employees. Well, we are starting to hire employees, but um, in the past few harvests, it's just been the two of us. So um, he's the brains behind all the chemistry um, that goes into winemaking, and I just help hit implement those. Yeah, and real quick segue there. I don't know if uh, anybody else knows this, but so we also do cider too. So yes. drone sellers and cider. Uh, that's another part of our business, and our cider is a uh, pet sparkling. nat style sparkling cider as well. <laughs> um, so any of you cider fans out there, you can also find our cider as well. It's delicious. At this moment, I would love to open up the floor to anyone that feels like they would like to uh, turn on their microphones and ask any questions. This is a great time for a Q&A before we thank Amy and Sean and say goodbye. Yeah, please. Um, yeah, anybody have any questions, please uh, feel free to jump on in. <laughs> so, um, you say that uh, the pet nut method is bottled earlier than the method champagnes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. correct. Is that right? Okay. And how do you write sans so? Oh, um, yeah, it's okay, spelled I can try weird. to hold it. Um, oh, you can't so well. really see it. Okay. So oh, it's, it's yeah. oh, okay. So yeah. lots, lots of people when they come in who've never heard it, but just read it, they say like sin salt. Um, yeah. Because yeah, so it's uh, C I N S A U L T. Yeah, it's uh, one of those tricky French French words, but it's <laughs> pronounced uh, sans so. Mm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I, I I mean I took wine classes and stuff, so I heard a lot. I, I mean uh, know about uh, method champagne was, but I didn't right. know anything about this petnard style at all. <laughs> Yeah, I know no, about this grape, the sin so grape, I've never heard of. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a, a fun one. Yeah, a fun style and kind of a up and coming style, it's starting to get a lot more popular. Um, people are starting to learn about it and discover it, and you'll see a lot more of it on the shelves um, coming out here. It's it's starting to really gain a a following as a category of sparkling wine of its own. But, yeah, and then and, 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 ask you to that if shelves. Is it possible for me in California to get it somehow? Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. Very important <laughs> question. Um, so we have an online store that's part of our website and you can order all of our wines and ciders right from our store. Um, oh. we, we can ship directly to California through our website and we are working on transitioning to full nationwide shipping on our website. Um, that should be live relatively soon. Um, anybody who is interested in it now can still order from us, but we have to forward you a different link just because of the complex state shipping laws. Um, but right now we can ship to um, Colorado, California, all of Washington. Um, Minnesota, Alaska, there's a few other random states. <laughs> um, but um, those of you in other states, like I said, for now, just email us and then we'll send you the link to our Vino Shipper cart, which uh, will let you um, ship other places. But yes, to answer your question, we can get it to you in California through our website. Oh, then we need to know, do we have the website name? Um, so it's just um, madronesellers.com. Um, so M-A-D-R-O-N-E and then sellers, C-E-L-L-R-S. Yeah. And I believe yeah, yes, <laughs> through this link, when you, you clicked on the links through Visit San Juan's, there should be like a link to our website through there. Or if you just Google Madrone Sellers, we'll pop up. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Barbara. We have a question asking if your grapes were affected by the wildfire smoke this year. Um, definitely affected. It's a question of how, how much. How much. <laughs> um, the... The biggest impact so far is just that it changed harvest 
some grapes had to come in earlier and the others were pushed back way later because of all the smoke. It really just delayed harvest for a few weeks. Everything but, kind of stopped ripening for a while. Yeah, there. it delayed ripening because of the, the cover. The smoke um, blocked the sun. Sorry, got the outside. Um, yeah, the smoke blocked the sun for a long time. So those those grapes that needed that extra sun to ripen all the way um, were delayed. Yeah, but so far with like smoke taint, which is something you can get from the fires, um, we haven't noticed any obvious smoke taint. We've been lucky so far. Um, we're keeping an eye on it, but so far I think we've come out unscathed with smoke taint. Fingers crossed it's going to stay that way because <laughs> it can always come out later in the wine and there's no real way of knowing till later. But uh, yeah. hope that Fingers. answers your question. Fingers yeah. crossed for you. Yeah. We've got another question asking when your tasting room is open. When can we come visit you? Ah. Yeah, um, so we're open them. Friday through Sunday um, from 12 to 6. So um, it's right on First Street, so um, up the street from Herbs and down the street from um, Friday mm. Harbor House and the Toy Box. It's kind of right in the middle of those. Yeah. Um, and yeah, come come on by. Uh, we're also like dog friendly. We love dogs. <laughs> Just <laughs> everyone knows. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, no, it's us. Uh, it, it'll be Sean working Friday and Sundays, and then uh, we've hired my mom as one our tasting room manager, so she works here on Saturdays now. So you yeah, can, come it's a family on by business. And, say hi. <laughs> and uh, we also have some food options too. Uh, we have a cheese and charcuterie board. If you want something to pair with your tasting, or if you're hungry, we got some good appetizers for you. So, come, feel free to come check it out. <laughs> yeah. Great. Well, thank you both. If there are any yeah, other questions. You. Please feel free to ask. Yeah. I have a question, Sean. Um, for the pet gnat, is it okay to drink the bottom of the bottle? Yeah. Oh, completely, yeah. I, like I said, yeah. I okay. enjoy the flavor of it. It's just uh, gonna be different than the rest of the wine. It's gonna be creamier. A little um, thicker. A little thicker, but- uh, Totally safe. Totally safe. It's, it's the same as if you're eating like, a yeast fermented product. It's only yeast in there. There's nothing unnatural nothing about it. It's just simply yeast. <laughs> it, it just gets a little hazier. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. So would it be would it be different to kind of mix it up and then drink it all this yeah. for everybody yep. the same it'll glass? Change, it'll change <laughs> the flavor slightly, but I think it's fun to compare the difference between the the more yeast portion and the less yeast portion because they'll taste different but you can feel free to mix it up if you want to um there's there's no wrong answer <laughs> okay <laughs> so just person personal our, preference. yeah our personal preference is just for um opening it not shaken because we like to have the clean up um you know the top and then have like that last glass be a little Easy. Yeah, and also a quick maybe word of caution for other pet gnats. Um, if you shake it up, you could cause it to like foam over and gush out of the bottle if you do that. Um, mm -hmm. Some pet gnats are more prone towards doing that than others. Ours doesn't do that, but you want to just be sure to like chill it down like all the way in the way. fridge um, before you mm -hmm. open it. But when you shake it up, sometimes it, it'll just Activate excite it. all the carbonation there and will cause it to like gush out so you know not a great idea to like shake the bottle and then open but it you, could but, you know a you gentle could mixing yeah. is probably all right right, <laughs> right thanks yeah. yeah um any other questions well um yeah if nobody has any other questions we just want to thank you for joining us yeah, for our, our virtual tasting and little educational series about sparkling here and uh, i hope you guys come come visit us come see what else we do and uh try our wine so uh cheers yeah thanks for joining us <laughs> cheers thank you both and thank you all for joining us please visit visit sanjuans.com slash saver for a list of future virtual events this upcoming wednesday we will be wine tasting with lopez island vineyards with Brent, mm -hmm. who's joining us today. Yeah. So Lopez yeah. Island Vineyards on Wednesday. And then on Friday, we'll be doing a food and wine pairing with Dobe Wine Company from Orcas Island. So we hope to see you there for those future events and maybe hopefully in the islands soon. We'll, we'll try to be there for both if we have time. Yeah. <laughs> see you Wednesday, Brent. <laughs>
All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye.